keep on fighting until we get our right to breathe and our right for clean air. Thousands of students are expected to take part in the county's largest ever high school walkout on climate change. I strike because I know my generation will be the ones affected most by climate change. I have a simple question. How many more cops are you going to have before we take action? All these different social justice issues are environmental issues as well, since the people that are experiencing the climate crisis first and worst are people of color um, and are women. You cannot tell me that you're gonna steal my children's futures away. You are negotiating what world my, grand, my grandkids are gonna be living in. You have to be able to promise me that they're gonna have a rich, sustainable, healthy, and just livelihood. <laughs> Hello again, thank you again. For our last panel this afternoon, and that's hard to believe, I'm joined by three climate activists who are trying to make the climate movement more inclusive. So Wawa Gatharu, Shia Bastida, and Alexandria Villasenor, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to talk first of all, um, Shia and Alexandria, to you about the experience of having climate change affect your family's lives and your own lives. And maybe Shia, you can talk to us a little bit about what happened in Mexico to your family's community. Of course. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having us. Thank you for hosting us. Um, we had just a long trip back from Egypt, from COP27. So we are you know, ready to talk about that, but also you know, just share a little bit about our experience. Um, I was born and raised in Mexico in a small town called San Pedro Tultepec, and I'm part of the Otomi Toltec indigenous community. So in my cosmology, everything is about reciprocity. It's about intergenerational dialogue. It's about taking care of Mother Earth because that is what we do. That's the principles. And seeing my own town, looking around, all of these relationships disrespected and broken. Uh, Mexico City taking our water from our aquifer to expand, uh, polluting industries, putting waste into a river that my dad used to bathe in. And in 2015, my hometown suffered from flooding, uh, which had never happened ever before. My grandmother had never seen that, and she's in her 80s. So for me, that was the moment where I couldn't, I couldn't grow, wait to grow up to get a degree to be part of climate solutions like my parents had. My parents met at the first ever Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. They've been working in the climate space way before I was born. And I wanted to follow their, their footsteps in terms of, you know, they've been writing about it, they've been going to UN conferences about it, championing indigenous rights. But I couldn't do that. I had to put myself out there at 15 years old. It was my first ever climate conference. Right. So it's, we're growing up too fast, but it's also important to share those But it's stories. very personal as well, as it was for you, Alexandria, in Northern California, right, where you experienced the wildfires. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Northern California, and we had wildfires all year round. But when I was younger, I, we didn't used to see a ton of wildfires. It's definitely changed. And so in um, November of 2018, I was in Northern California when the campfire happened in Paradise, California. And at the time, it was California's worst wildfire in its history. It ended up covering the entire area in this thick, unbreathable smoke. And um, the air quality at the time was the worst in the world. And so it was a very scary experience, um, especially because I didn't understand why it was happening. But it was once I edu educated myself and started to see the connection between the two, that's when I knew I had to get involved. And we're still seeing wildfires. And I think that everybody who becomes an activist gets involved because they see something happening in their own community. They see how they're being affected or how others are being affected. And so when it comes to climate change, um, people are having a wake-up call just because of the effects that we're seeing every single day. So, Wawa, you came into this a little differently, I think, because 
you're of Kenyan descent from a long line of farmers, but it was an environmentalism class that brought you into this movement, is that right? Exactly, and you know, it's so interesting because I really grew up with really um, strong, positive environmental values. Mm -hmm. um, like she was talking about, I also grew up in a black indigenous um, family, and um, the concept of reciprocity and the concept of taking care of our planet and actually mm. being a part of nature ourselves was something that was passed along to us. However, my understanding of environmentalism and who an environmentalist could be very much so was not me. It felt like a very top shelf white issue and it wasn't until I took that environmental science class when I was 16 that my teacher had decided to go the extra step and make the connections between racial justice and gender justice mm. and environmental justice and that that's where I was able to connect the dots that, oh, all these issues that I have cared about for so long and I feel are so fundamentally a part of uh, myself and my well-being and that of my community are intrinsically environmental issues as well. So talk about sort of top shelf. Shia, you've just come back from COP27, as you said, and I think another very well-known activist, um, Greta Thunberg, decided not to go. Mm. Um, she said she thought it was about influential people greenwashing um, and backed out of it. Having been there, is that a fair take? Is there a lot of sort of talk and greenwashing going on? Or did you really come away feeling that there's good work going on at an institution like COP now? Well, um, Coca-Cola was a sponsor at COP. There's about 600 fossil fuel lobbyists at COP, 20% up from last COP, COP25. Give so, us numbers again, just say how many? Uh, about 600, 639 yeah. were yeah. registered, yeah. but we don't know exactly how many actually arrived. Um, so we are seeing that the space that is supposed to be where decisions for the future are made are infiltrated by this interest of the industry that gets $11 million of subsidies per minute. By the end of this panel, the fossil fuel industry will have gotten $221 million in subsidies. And by the end of today, they will have made $2.8 billion in profit. So these numbers, for me, the numbers what matter are that you talk about 2100, that you talk about the, the world that my grandchildren are gonna be living in. Mm -hmm. And COP, they're trying to distract us everywhere. There's sections for pavilions, which is where uh, we had the children and youth pavilion, um, the climate justice pavilion, the just transition pavilion are there. In a different hall, you have the negotiations going on. So you're dividing civil society and negotiations in such a stark way so that we don't know what's going on there. But the difference this time is that youth, because we cannot protest so much in Egypt, we decided to really pay attention to negotiations. Mm -hmm. And we're following three tracks, loss and damage, adaptation, um, and finance. We want a loss and damage financing facility that allocates $100 billion a year that the Global North promised to the Global South. But this cannot be done without the mechanism to actually make the money, make it to the ground. So, Alexandria, maybe you can pick up on that notion of mechanisms and the notion of reparations. Mm -hmm. um, how was that advanced during COP27, that the discussion? And do you think it's a, a way of readjusting balances in a just way going ahead? Yeah, well, I think reparations is at the core of climate justice because really we need to start having conversations about the communities that are being the most affected by the climate crisis. And so that's why the first day at COP when loss and damage was added to the agenda, it was a huge win for us um, and for activists all around the world. And so I think that one of the big differences for this COP was the fact that there was such a huge youth presence. And even though we were separated, we were still having a big impact with the people we were having conversations with and the people we were connecting to. And I think that that was the key, but we still needed to find our way in every different space possible. And I think one thing that was really interesting too was that there was a lot of fossil fuel representation. One of the, lar the largest delegation at COP was the fossil fuel industry. And so there was a panel where a fossil fuel executive executive actually was on stage blaming civil society and blaming everyone who was there saying that you are the reason that this is an issue. You should not be blaming us. You don't actually know what it would mean to transition to renewable energy. And I think that that is not the type of conversations that we can be having in those spaces at COP. We need to be focusing on reducing global greenhouse gas emissions right now. And at COP, there's a huge conversation about adaptation, which is a very important topic and conversation. We need to be focusing on adjusting to the climate crisis because we're already seeing the effects today. 
but we need to be focusing on reducing our global greenhouse gas emissions and not shifting our conversation to something else. Well, among the people who are not meeting their targets are the top emitters, I think China, the US, India, the EU, right? Um, Wawa, what do you think, as a young person, you can do to change that? What, what has to happen to try and bring big, powerful countries in, in line? Well, one, showing up at COP is really important. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go due to family loss. But something that I think is really interesting is that though there is a youth presence at COP, it was exceedingly more difficult this year, I think, comparatively than to the last three years, for people to get badges at COP, especially frontline youth and especially African youth activists, right? Right now, COP is being held in Egypt as opposed to represent the interests of Africans. And when you looked around at the youth that were represented, oftentimes you weren't seeing African youth platformed. Right now, if you go on Twitter, there are multiple threads, hundreds of threads of African climate activists that are requesting for funds to be able to access going to COP, whether that is a flight, whether that is to simply have accommodation, because it's, it's exceedingly expensive. What we need to do as young people is show up at these negotiations. We need to make our voices heard. Um, obviously, this year um, in Egypt, um, protesting in the same way that it has been done at previous COPs wasn't necessarily uh, the same possibility, but getting creative with the ways that we're making our voices learn, uh, heard, as well as um, really taking ownership of our own spaces, like um, she was just talking about. Um, this year was the first time there was a youth-oriented pavilion, and I believe it was one of the only ones that wasn't um, endorsed and funded by you know the fossil fuel industry, <laughs> which is insane, but also says something about the integrity that we have as young people, because this is our present, this is our future, and I think we're setting a really important precedent for the rest of the world and the rest of the generations on what needs to happen. So, but, you know, when we have, when we're writing about climate, when I'm thinking about things, a lot of the targets are like 2050, obviously, but they slip to 2060, 2070. The time when, by, by which time you'll be retired. <laughs> what, what needs, she would, she would take, take that on, what needs to happen to, to bring this back within a, um, a time frame that makes sense yeah. for you guys, for your children, for your grandchildren? Yeah, well, you know, right now we are talking about those faraway targets um, and I don't even know what 2050 means for me. Like, I am going to be 48 years old in 2050. Right now my mom is 49 and she has two children that she still cares for. By 2050, the statistics say that two billion children, almost all children in the world, will experience heat waves. Those are gonna be my children when I'm 48. So for me, I think these timelines are far away, but they're also very close. Mm -hmm. And right now we're uh, debating in COP26 whether to keep 1.5 degrees alive again. We had that conversation at COP25, COP26. Um, and at COP27 is being had again. 1.5 shouldn't be a target, it's a limit. So that's really what we're saying as youth. 1.5 is, all, we're already gonna be seeing massive changes, like we're already seeing flooding, we're already seeing displacement. And so I think to really feel those, those uh, timelines in a, as close as possible, we need to look at what's happening around us. In every minute, there is one truckload of trash going into the ocean. Right now, uh, there's about 8,000 flights going around the world. By the end of the day, there are gonna be 100,000 flights are, are gonna be having taken off and landed. So the timelines are very long, but they're also very, very short. By the end of the panel, 420 hectares of forest will have been cut down. Mm. I think those are the things we need to remember. What is happening right now in the world that we can stop? And once we see that the climate crisis reflects itself in every minute of our lives, as well as in the time where we're gonna be mothers, that is when you understand that this is not a game for me of shuffling emissions, getting some offsets here, doing some mental gymnastics to get net zero. It's my life. Right, and I'm thinking we're up to COP27, and we should remind everybody that's the UN Climate Change Conference there. We're up to COP27, and we've had agreements that have not been met. But Alexandria, let me ask you a little bit about what you expected of this US administration. And I think back in 2020, you saw Biden, President Biden come in, and you said um, that it gave a fighting chance, that change, to bring about some good legislation, advantage, advantageous legislation. Has that happened? Are you seeing the kind of movement over the past two years that you had hoped to see two years ago? 
Well, I think what was really interesting is while I was at COP, um, I was focusing on everything happening there, but I was also focusing on the midterm elections. Um, I stayed up all night waiting to see the results. And I think that one thing that is so important with is, with is what is happening with the US and our administration is just the power of youth. It was the youth turnout, the youth power, who are the reasons why um, this midterm wasn't a mess. And if it didn't go the way that it went, it, we, it could have totally changed the entire climate action um, system within the US. And so I think that the power of youth is really where I see the hope. Um, it was youth who pushed the Biden administration to start coming up with commitments. It was the communities on the ground. And so really the power of young people is where I really see the action within the US administration. And I'm only 17, I can't vote yet. Um, but <laughs> I'm still so proud of my generation for what we're doing and how we're pushing the US administration. So while you were here during the midterms, you were watching all those changes, it looks as if it's going to be harder going ahead for the Biden administration to pass last bills, maybe push back against the Inflation Reduction Act. How do you see the next two years going? Are you optimistic looking ahead or do you? You know, I'm a stubborn optimist. A stubborn you have optimist. To be. That's a great you, phase. You we need more of them. Be. You have to be. And you know, what's, what's so interesting um, is that I think if I didn't have a historical context of the way that young people have constantly been at the forefront of every social movement that has come to fruition, I would feel really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, as, as Gen Zers, what can we do to change the course of the next two years, a lifetime? But the reality is, is that people have fought for their lives before, right? The civil rights movement, many of the leaders are still alive to this day and are actually coaching their grandchildren of how to stand up for a better climate future. So I see a lot of the hope, right, in, in, in young people and young people bringing conversations around environmental justice, climate justice. I mean, those terms weren't even in the political arena, uh, you know, five years ago at presidential debates. Now people are putting it within their platforms and their running platforms. So I, I am a stubborn optimist because of the power of young people, because of the power especially of black and brown led environmental justice organizations that have continued to mobilize and continue to push the work forward even when we aren't even um, platformed and understood as movers and shakers in the climate movement. So that's where I put a lot of my hope and a lot of my trust. Alexandria, I want to come back to you a little bit more. And, uh, you know, we have new democratic governors coming in. It could be that this moves from more of a federal issue to a state issue. How do you think that will affect climate activism for your generation? Do you see yourselves acting more at a state level? I think, uh, uh, I think the way that it's going to affect us is we're going to start pushing a lot more for systemic change. Um, and that's really where it's gonna start, is we're gonna start getting involved as well and more in the political system and also um, coming up with the solutions ourselves and proposing them. Because too often when youth activists are protesting, we say climate action now, and our politicians and governments come to us and they're like, well, what specifically do you want to see? And because of that, we have to start showing up with the solutions and telling our governments exactly what we want to see. So I think because of that, um, we're going to start to see more young people joining the conversations and making space for us in those conversations and pushing for more um, federal change on the systemic level. So we have only two minutes left, and I'd like to ask you all the last question, and it really is a sort of summary of what we've been going through today. You're all very keen to increase inclusion for and that means inclusion for women too why does it matter that women get involved in the climate movement and we're gonna have to be quick but why don't you go first just run down the line well okay, I'll go yep. first okay so women um, exist at the forefront of the climate movement and at the forefront of climate injustice because our um, basic rights continue to be infringed upon at varying degrees across the world. However, we shouldn't be infantilized because the reality is women around the world are creating solutions as a means of survival. Women around the world are creating solutions for the means of survival. Shia, go ahead. Well, I think women should be at the forefront because the world that we are in was created by men and all of our international relations relation, or all of our international relations frameworks have been about taking emotions out of decision making. Morgenthau's six principles of political realism say do not include emotions in decision making. And what is more needed in this planet now than love? The courage of love. Um, so, you know, out of, in COP, only seven world leader women, only seven of the world leaders were women out of 110 present. 
We need women at the forefront. We yes. need women at the forefront. Alexandria, last word. Um, when I got involved in climate activism um, when I was 13, it was young women who were leading the climate movement, and people would ask me all the time, why? And it is because young women are on the forefront of the climate crisis, and so we need young women who are leading the solutions. And what I'll lead with, um, leave with is that the climate justice movement is intersectional with every movement out there. And so in order to get climate justice, we need women's rights and reproductive rights. We need women's rights and reproductive rights. So time to love. Thank you all, three of you, very much for joining us. Wawa, Shia, Alexandria. It was wonderful to have you. And great to have those, great to have those inspiring words. That's all we have. What a wonderful way to round out the afternoon. I hope, as Sally Busby said this morning when you came in, that you leave with a greater sense of women's role in shaping our current world and defining our futures. And it leaves me now to thank you all for coming and to hope you will join us uh, next door for a reception. Thank you to our audience.